Has Israel become the world's burdensome stone spoken of in Zechariah 12? All of this goes far beyond the Palestinians and Islam and Hamas. There's never going to be a political solution to this religious problem. It's only going to be solved when the Messiah returns, the Lord Jesus. The ultimate source of this is satanic because Satan hates what God loves. And God loves uh, the Jewish people. And we love what God loves. Welcome to Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell, brought to you by Olive Tree Ministries. Today, Jan visits with three guests, Dr. Mark Hitchcock and two representatives from Chosen People Ministries, Olivier Melnick and Trevor Rubenstein. How are today's events lining up with Bible prophecy? And what position should Christians take in the new global war against the Jews? We discuss this and much more in today's uninterrupted programming. There's a much deeper agenda, I believe, Iran has, and it's brought out in some of these articles. They say that the Khamenei, the, the, the Ayatollah, has a four-stage plan. Uh, stage one was this Hamas attack. So that, that was the first stage of this, but that was just stage one. Stage two is to bog Israel down in ground and underground fighting. So the, the Israel's going to go into to, to, uh, Gaza. There's going to be ground fighting and underground fighting in those tunnels, and they want to see Israel get bogged down there. So they'll do everything they can to make that last as long as it, it, they, they can and to drag that out. When Israel then gets bogged down in this ground and underground fighting in Gaza, uh, step three is to unleash Hezbollah. So Hezbollah's up in Syria and in, in, in southern Lebanon, then to unleash their other proxy, Hezbollah from the north. And Hezbollah is much, a much greater uh, uh, military force uh, than Hamas. But then the ultimate goal, it's stated, is to exploit this mess and hide enough military-grade enriched uranium for a large number um, of nuclear bombs. So you can see here a strategy of a Hamas attack, then get Israel bogged down, then get Israel in a multi-front war up there with Hezbollah, maybe even from the West Bank, from the Palestinians who are there, and then use all of this mess to hide their ultimate intention, which is to get a nuclear weapon, which would be you know, a, a massive, massive game changer uh, there in, in the Middle East. Welcome to the program. Glad you can join me today. It's now been over a month since the now infamous October 7th massacre of southern Israel. A new level of evil has been identified, and we're not going to relive some of those graphic details today. And as I've been preparing for today's programming, we know Jews are literally being hunted down. I mean, almost like 1938. The world's hatred is almost worse than 1938, if that's possible. I saw a headline the other day, The Global War on the Jews. We know that happens under the Antichrist. Didn't think it would happen before then. So we now have a war of civilization versus medieval barbarism. Seeing the shades of Zechariah 12 being fulfilled, Israel's becoming the world's burdensome stone. I did not think I would be alive to see some of this, and we know this transpires in the tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week, and no, we're not in it. We are clearly in a run-up to it. As I said, we have Jews being hunted down in parts of the world in Dagestan, Russia. They were hunted even far worse than the late 1800s in Russia when some of my family members fled the Russian pogroms for Minnesota's Iron Range, but now Jews on some college campuses and other hot spots are hiding and wondering where can they run to. I'm going to talk to three special guests this hour. I open here with Dr. Mark Hitchcock, and we will consider some prophetic connections to the Mideast conflict in part one of my programming. In part two, I am joined by representatives from Chosen People Ministries, Olivier Melnick and Trevor Rubenstein. Dr. Mark Hitchcock, he's written a book. We'll say a little bit more about that. It has a little twist to it here that we didn't expect. Co-authored with Jimmy Evans, the title is What's Next? Israel-Gaza War, Connecting Today's Headlines to Tomorrow's Prophetic Events. Welcome, Mark, to the program. Thanks. It's always great to be with you, Jan. We're going to dive right into the dilemma. We want to get to the theological issues here as quickly as possible. However, you've thrown me a curveball, and that is you put this book that you were going to release, you and Jimmy Evans, and you went through Amazon, and I learned today that 
they might not let you do it? Tell me about it. Yeah, it's shocking. I've written a lot of books, and so has Jimmy Evans. And what they did, I help out with their ministry. I do a video yes. each week with endtimes.com with Jimmy Evans, and Jimmy's done several books as well. And so we took a sermon that I preached here at our church, several videos that I've done, some videos that Jimmy's done, and we kind of put all that together and added some more to it and wanted to get a book out there in people's hands that people could have quickly to understand what's going on from a biblical perspective. And it was sent into Amazon, and they were going to have it out within a couple of days. And then it's been like three days and isn't out yet. So I contacted the folks at endtimes.com, and they said the book has been flagged by Amazon. I said, well, what does that mean? I said, well, they're not agreeing to release it and to put it out. They're going to have to investigate it. So the folks at endtimes.com, Jimmy Evans and his son, Brent Evans, they're investigating this to find out what the issues are. But one can only surmise, you know, I've written a lot of books about prophecy and the end times. You can just surmise with this, this is such a polarizing issue, really an inflammatory issue. And I think if it were a book that were written that they could interpret as being pro-Palestinian, it probably would pass through very quickly. But to me, it just seems like another, really not even a veiled anti-Semitism. This book, they would know that it's pro-Israel and they don't want it out there. So I don't know when it's going to be released or if it will be released. It's been flagged by them. This is uncharted territory yeah. for me and for endtimes.com and Jimmy Evans. But here we're talking about all these things happening in the avalanche of anti-Semitism in our world today. And here we do this book and this happens. So it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy yes. in a sad, tragic way. The anti-Semitism unleashed on the Jews, it's staggering. It certainly has the furor of the 1930s and 40s. There is no single dictator behind it, as with Adolf Hitler, but the entire Arab population of one billion people certainly are instigating this terrible hatred of the Jewish people. And many of those one billion people, not all of them, of course, but many of them would like to annihilate every Jew. Yet we still can't compare what's going on today, Mark, right now, with the anti-Semitism that's coming in the tribulation under the Antichrist. I think it'd be helpful if you gave us a paragraph or two on what might be happening at that time. Believers aren't going to be here. We're not even going to know about it, but it is coming. It's around the corner somewhere. The rapture is going to take place. The believers will be caught up to heaven. Jews and Gentiles who are believers in Jesus yeah. Christ will be raptured away, the bride of Christ. But the Antichrist will be the ultimate anti-Semite, the ultimate human anti-Semite. The ultimate anti-Semite is Satan himself, because all the way back in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3.15, there was a battle set up there between Satan versus the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman is the ultimate deliverer, the Messiah will come. And of course, when God selects Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, that's the line of the Messiah. Satan set out to wipe them out, to destroy the Jewish people. Well, Jesus came. Satan incited the Jewish leaders and the Romans to kill him. He was raised from the dead. And now Satan is on what I call Plan B. He's trying to wipe out all the Jews in the world because God's made promises to them that he'll fulfill in the coming kingdom, the millennial kingdom. So he's trying to thwart and derail and torpedo the promises of God and wiping out the Jewish people. So his final all-out effort to do that will be during the tribulation. He's going to know time is short. And Revelation 12 tells us about the woman. The woman there is Israel. And the beast is going to chase the woman. The woman's going to flee into the wilderness. God's going to supernaturally protect many in Israel. There'll be 144,000 Jewish males who are converted. God will supernaturally protect during that time. But it's going to be a time of the worst anti-Semitism in human history. And it's hard to believe that as bad as it's been. But yeah. this is just the age-long hatred of the Jewish people. And what we see today happening, it's totally irrational. And that shows this satanic element to it. Satan is making what's irrational look rational to people. It's hard to believe what it's going to be like during the tribulation period. But what we see today, this is just like a prairie fire that's yeah. come up so suddenly. It's a precursor and a faint foreshadow of what's going to happen in the future in the tribulation period. So this is just another sign that's mushroomed right before our eyes. I was intrigued by your introduction as to the three and four part plan that's probably on the horizon sort of a four-stage plan. Stage one, Hamas attacks. Stage two, bog Israel down in underground fighting, tunnels, etc. When she's ground down, unleash step number three. That would be Hezbollah, which I do think is inevitable. And then ultimately exploit this and hide military-grade enriched uranium for a large number of nukes. That would be Iran. It sounds to me like a setup again. We've talked about this repeatedly for the Gog, Magog, Ezekiel 38, 39, 
Russian invasion of Israel. I want to say a little bit more about that this segment. And you certainly feel this is a run-up to that, setting the stage for that. It is. You've got the players in place. You know, Iran is one of the key players. And of course, you know, their hatred for Israel is on full display right now through these proxies. And what we see happening in Russia, in Dagestan, in the airport, they were running around looking for Jews to lynch. In Turkey, four of the nations there that are named in yeah. Ezekiel 38, the ancient places, Meshach, Tubal, Togomar, Togarma, and Gomer, are modern Turkey. There were hundreds of thousands of pro-Palestinian protesters in Istanbul, and the president there, President Erdogan in Turkey, addressed them. He accused Israel of war crimes. He says that Hamas is not a terrorist organization. And so Israel is pulling their diplomats now out of Turkey and reassessing their relationship with Turkey. And this whole relationship has turned just now on a dime. You've got all these players lining up in a staggeringly brief time. I saw a headline today before we began our programming here. The headline was Vladimir Putin turns on Netanyahu as he sees Israel as Russia's enemy. No great surprise, but there's strong language now between at least Putin towards Netanyahu. Israel has become Russia's enemy. That is interesting. We knew that was going to happen, but right now I think the whole world's an enemy of Israel other than some Christians, and thankfully some nations that love freedom are sticking with her too. There's an article that was in CNN. The headline says, a new wave of anti-Semitism threatens to rock an already unstable world. Our our world was already unstable. And then you have an event like this takes place that's just polarizing the world. You're right that the world seems to be against Israel. You know, something that stunned me, we've seen a lot of these riots, protests, whatever you want to call them, on college campuses in the United States. But I read that in the demographic of 18 to 24-year-olds, 3 in 10 of them say the U.S. should support Hamas in this conflict, Mm 30%. 26% of them say the solution of all this problem is for Israel to be ended in the land given to Hamas Mm -hmm. and Palestinians. So that's the future of our country. There's still people that are a little bit older that support Israel. But for younger people like this, the support for Israel is just completely eroding. Did you see that, Mark, before this happened? Or were you rather taken aback like I was? With all the anti-Semitism? Actually, in the United States last year, in 2022, was the most reports of anti-Semitic incidents in the United Mm -hmm. States history. In 2022, before this happened. Since this has happened, it's up 400%. But I assumed it would take a little bit longer. I thought people would come out and condemn Hamas more and then eventually begin to condemn Israel. But it was from the beginning. And we have people in our own Congress, senators and people in the House of Representatives saying things that Israel's killing children, they're committing war crimes. It's the very things that Hamas did, Mm -hmm. but they're accusing Israel of them. So again, it just shows it's an irrational hatred that I think people that don't understand the demonic, satanic component of this don't really understand. I think the greatest takeaway is the accelerated and intensified longing for peace on the part of the Israelis and on the part of many observers worldwide who are more than disgusted with the brutality of our day. People are going to run into the arms of the Antichrist if he can guarantee peace, and he's going to guarantee peace to Israel. They're longing to hear somebody who's going to guarantee them peace. Well, here he comes, Mr. Fix-It, the man with a plan. He is going to offer them a peace treaty, Daniel 9.27. This is the setup. It is. This is the setup for all of it. you got the peace treaty, people clamoring for that. You've got all these nations of Ezekiel 38 lining up. At the same time, we've got all the lawlessness we see in our world, the globalism, AI, all these technologies, central bank digital currencies. With what's happened here in the last month, it's like the floodgates have been opened. And when there's crises like this, the stage setting is Mm -hmm. accelerated. The stage is kind of being set. When these crises happen, everything seems to go into overdrive. I heard someone not long ago make a statement that I agree with wholeheartedly. He says, you look at our world today, and it looks like we're in the two-minute warning. And to me, that's a good analogy or way to think of this. We don't know when Jesus is coming, but things can't go on like they are in Israel in the Middle East for decades. This boiling cauldron over there, the fuse has been lit. The lid's going to blow off. And so I look at this, and it should cause all of us who are believers to be filled with hope in Christ's coming and make sure that we're living a life that's pleasing to the Lord and be sharing with others. I can't imagine how much more stage setting there will be before Christ comes. Be sure to catch Dr. Mark Hitchcock's updates online. By the way, he is pastor of Faith Bible Church in Edmond, Oklahoma. We carry a number of his products. 
We are talking about a book that they were hoping to come out here, actually, in the next few days. What's next? Israel, Gaza war, connecting today's headlines to tomorrow's prophetic events. Hold on, folks. Don't go searching for it quite yet because Amazon's not cooperating and they apparently have some political thoughts of their own. And I want to play this little clip of you, Mark. Let me just say a final word about about how this is setting the stage. Um, What's coming in the future for Israel is a peace agreement. It's going to be a temporary one. It's going to be a counterfeit peace. The Antichrist will broker. But you can imagine in the wake of all this, people are going to be clamoring for a, a, a permanent peace there. Israel, at some point in time, I think we'll get a peace with this, with Saudi Arabia. Uh, there's going to be this, this, this peace agreement that will come. This is setting the stage for that Antichrist agreement that's going to bring peace to the Middle East. It's also setting the stage for the war of Ezekiel 38. Um, Iran has their fingerprints all over this. They're mentioned in Ezekiel 38. Russia, I mean, this whole invasion was a, was a gift of, of Hamas into Israel was a gift of Vladimir Putin to take the focus off his war in Ukraine. Turkey's uh, president, Erdogan, his response, he said this, we're against the killing of civilians in Israel. But then listen to what he says next. But we also oppose the massacre of defenseless innocents in Gaza. He just calls them civilians in Israel killed, but he calls it a massacre of defenseless innocents. There was a massacre of defenseless innocents in Israel. But it shows where his uh, true affections lie. And, and Turkey and Iran and Russia are the three key players in the Ezekiel 38, uh, 39 invasion. Mark, let me just talk for a minute about the hooks in the jaws that will bring Russia down. You feel the hook might partly be the relationship Russia has with Iran. We think of hooks as the natural resources. Most very likely there's going to be natural gas, the wealth of the Dead Sea, etc., And we don't think of a hook being a geopolitical alignment with Russia and Iran. And I think you do feel that's one of the hooks. Yeah, it's interesting there in Ezekiel 38, it talks about this leader Gog of Magog and Rosh. And it says, I'm going to turn you around and I'm going to put hooks into your jaws. Now, word to turn around there in Hebrew has the idea of you're going one way and you turn around and you're pulled the other direction. And it's interesting, this sudden about face that Russia has made, that Vladimir Putin has made. All of a sudden, just in a very brief time now, they've basically put themselves against Israel. I think a lot of this is being motivated by their relationship with Iran. Iran is putting a lot of pressure on Russia. They're sending all kinds of drones to Russia. They're arming Russia. Russia's sending planes, some aircraft and other things back to Iran. So even right now, I think we see that Russia's turning against Israel now is probably motivated by their relationship with Iran. And of course, part of it is Russia is going to want to be at odds with anything that's going to hurt the United States. They're going to be contrary in any way. And so they see us coming to Israel's defense. And so they're going to immediately be against Israel because they want to counterbalance what we're doing in Ukraine. That's a fascinating statement there. They're going to turn you around and put hooks in your jaws. And the turnaround from Putin, not long ago, to a very friendly, very cordial relationship with Prime Minister Netanyahu, to where things are now, there's been a huge turnaround. So I think that Russia's relationship with, could be Turkey as well, but primarily what we see with Iran, could end up being those hooks that pull them into what eventually will be that Gog-Magog invasion in Ezekiel 38. It's growing more probable each day that Israel could actually strike Iran, which would be quite a challenge because a lot of her nuclear facilities are underground, buried within mountains, etc., You would think that this would require some U.S. help, but I doubt that they would get any U.S. help. She's probably going to be on her own if she does strike Iran. Do you think we could wake up one of these mornings and see a headline that this has actually happened? I do. I think that it's likely that if Hezbollah is unleashed on Israel, I think Israel is going to do something to Iran to punish them because they know this is where this came from. And if they don't cut off the head of the snake, as it were, if they don't deal with that, they just keep dealing with these proxies. And that's what Iran wants. They're not losing their own citizens or just supplying these proxies to be involved. So I think Israel is going to do something against Iran. Now, will it be obvious that it's from Israel? Will they have some way to camouflage it where people won't know where it's from? Will they assassinate some high-ranking leaders there? I don't know. But from the rhetoric I've heard from Prime Minister Netanyahu, It sounds to me like Israel is just kind of biding their time till they're going to do something against Iran. But I think the United States is going to have to as well. There have been 24 attacks and counting 
against our installations exactly. in Syria and Iraq, all by these proxy groups that are related to Iran. And we really haven't done much to hit back on that. And we're going to have to do something more than we hit a couple supply depots and things like that. We're going to have to do more ourselves. Once the dominoes begin to fall in something like this, it's always very difficult to predict how it's going to end. Learn more at endtimes.com. And as I said, you might check the online videos that Mark posts at least once a week. I find them under Mark Hitchcock on YouTube, but you can get more information at endtimes.com. We'll keep you apprised on the fate of the book that we've been talking about as I speak. It's not available because the publisher, Amazon, is not cooperating. Apparently, there's something that they don't like. Obviously, Dr. Hitchcock has taken a pro-Israel approach. My hunch is, Mark, you've just taken a biblical approach in this book, right? That's right. That's all we've done. It's really sad when you think about this. I get on Amazon and just look for books I want to read. You think about all of the trash that's on Amazon, the books. Exactly. What many of these books have in them is terrible ungodly in any kind of way. And you write a book analyzing from a biblical perspective what's happening over there. Our book's not inflammatory in any way. Any things we say about Hamas or other groups are just off their own websites. It's what they say about themselves. We're just reporting what they say. When you do that, the book gets flagged. That in itself is sadly for us, that's a story within this story. Yes, absolutely. Let me ask you this, Mark, and this is a touchy question, and I'm having to deal with it daily. Do you think that What's been going on now here for over a month now is a game changer in the church. And by that, I mean, will the church's stand on Israel perhaps become the new great divide? In other words, has Israel become a burdensome stone, not just to the world, but to the church today, because Israel is an offense? Yes, I think that's true. You've got a lot of people out there that are very liberal, and their response to this is easily predicted. They're going to be, for the Palestinians, Hamas, they're going to take that side. And you have those of us who understand the Bible, the covenants God's made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're going to stand with Israel. We're going to stand on Genesis 12, 3. But I think there's a squishy middle out yes. there, a soft middle, yes. where a lot of pastors, maybe that even hold the viewpoint we hold, don't really want to talk about it. There's others that are amillennialists, that are preterists. They don't see any significance to modern Israel. So they don't really have anything to say about it, you know, other than just pray, there'll be minimal loss of life and all, which I pray for that as well. But they don't have a biblical answer for what's happening. And if you don't understand what the Bible says about Israel's past and their present and future, you can't understand what's going on. And I do believe that the people who are looking at this and have maybe grown up in churches where they heard something about Israel in the past are wondering, why isn't my pastor talking about this? Who do we support in this? Again, not politically, but from a biblical point of view. I talked to you earlier. We've had people coming to our church. You have heard what we do, what we talk about, how we address these issues, preach the sermon about it. And they've told me the letters they've written to their pastors, the conversations they've had, and the responses that I've heard from that are pretty chilling. Mark, I want to close our segment with this clip of you. And you summarize the importance of what's going on and the eternal consequence of what's going on so appropriately here. I was reading uh, an article by Joel Rosenberg this week, and he had a beautiful statement here that I want to share with you as I close, kind of relating what's happening over there today to Acts chapter 8 and and this man coming to faith in Christ on the Gaza road. He says this, Yes, many of the leaders and people of Gaza are wicked. Yes, they hate Israel and the Jews. And yes, if they don't repent and turn to Christ, they will face judgment. But God loves the people of Gaza. Christ commands us to love Israel and her neighbors. He sends his servants to bring the gospel to Gaza. Perhaps many Palestinians in Gaza will reject the gospel, but some won't. Some will receive Christ as their Savior and Lord. And that's what we hope will happen. We need to pray to that end. God has doom prophesied for that part of the world, but God still is is saving people and rescuing people out. And we need to pray that in Gaza, in West Bank, Hezbollah, those areas, God will reach down and will save people. And he'll save Jewish people as well uh, before the rapture comes, before they're left behind. Very well said, Mark. I've got a minute left. It's all yours if you want to wrap it up here. I always like to say it's great to know what the future holds, future of the world and future of Israel. But, you know, the most important thing is for us to know our future. Someone who's listening today, you can know your future by putting your faith in Jesus Christ and trusting in him. You can know that you'll go to heaven when you leave this world. He purchased a pardon for you and he died on the cross. And you can receive that full pardon that Jesus purchased. And so it's great to know where all these things are headed, but know where you're headed. 
And for those of us who know the Lord in these times, we need to be earnestly in prayer. We don't want to panic about what's happening. You know, there's never a panic in heaven. Yeah. One of my friends has said that the Trinity never meets an emergency session. Mm. God's got it all figured out. He has a plan that he's executing, that he's bringing to pass, and we're seeing it unfold. And it's a burden in some ways for us, but it's also we have to consider it a great privilege to see things are unfolding in the way the Bible tells us, and it ought to cause us to rise up and be prepared ourselves and be proclaiming this good news to those that we meet. People are talking about this yes. where you work, in your neighborhood, family gatherings, Turn the conversation from the political and the military, turn it to the gospel and the leverage this to turn it to conversations about Jesus Christ and who he is and he's coming again. Dr. Mark Hitchcock, Faith Bible Church, Edmond, Oklahoma. You hear him on this program very often. We'll keep you apprised about this new book that hopefully will come out. There's no guarantee, obviously. I don't think we know exactly what's going on, but it's pretty strange. And I think Dr. Hitchcock may have labeled it just right. We've got some folks at that particular establishment we've been talking about who may not be very pro-Israel. That's just the mood of the world. Mark, thank you so much for joining me. Really, really appreciate it. We'll stay in touch. Say, folks, Pastor Brandon Holthouse has asked me to give a promo for his Truth About Israel conference, Saturday, November 18th, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific time. The proceeds are going to go to support the IDF It's going to provide tactical gear for the soldiers and also provide food, water, and other necessity speakers. Billy Crone, Tom Hughes, David Tall, Bill Koenig, Olivier Melnick, and of course, Brandon Holthouse. The cost to attend, and that's Rock Harbor Church in Bakersfield, California, $125 the cost to live stream. You'll have access to everything for 30 days, $30.00. Remember, folks, we live in a world that is constantly lying about Israel and the Jewish people and the media, academia, geopolitical, everyone, all spewing hateful propaganda and just blatant lies. Saturday, November the 18th, 9 a.m., 5 p.m., if you can attend Rock Harbor Church, Bakersfield, California, in person, $125. Live stream it, $30. I hope you will, one way or another, be able to tap into this wonderful The Truth About Israel Conference, November 18th, 9 a.m., 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Say, moving into part two of my programming today, I'm going to be joined by Olivier Melnick and Trevor Rubenstein of Chosen People Ministries. And I am troubled to put it mildly by headlines that now state that there is a global war on Jews. Really? Reuters reports that there is a, quote, open hatred of Jews surging globally, close quote. Attacks on Jewish people are soaring 1,000 and even 2,000 percent. Imagine that. Jews are in hiding in many places, starting with U.S. college campuses. Screaming mobs are trying to beat down the doors that are protecting fearful Jewish students all across U.S. campuses. And many of you saw the lust to assault, even kill, Jews in Dagestan, Russia, a week ago. Demons have been loosed all over the world in a fit that would be expected perhaps during Daniel's 70th week, or known as the biblical tribulation, to see these scenes here in the church age, I think is shocking, as the civilized world thought that they were silenced after the Holocaust. So when it comes to Satan's war against the Jews, let me just say that understand that it will never, ever cease. It will only escalate as we near that time of Jacob's trouble, outlined in the Bible. And now that the world has declared Jerusalem, the Jews, and Israel to be the world's burdensome stone, Zechariah 12, I do pray that the church is standing against this. Now, I did get an email. Let me read it here quickly. She says, My church gave a prayer for all in Palestine. When I asked, Why not Israel? They explained that they were referring to the geographical region of Palestine, which includes Israel. I had a long discussion where I learned that they believe in replacement theology this is a nightmare. I don't know when the church, not just mine, stopped believing the Bible, but this is horrifying. So the writer is right. Replacement theology is indeed horrifying, but it is the prominent teaching in our churches today, and that would be that the church inherited all the promises given to Israel. But they only want to claim the promises. They want nothing to do with the curses that have come upon the Jewish people. Joining me now, Olivier Melnick, Trevor Rubenstein. Olivier, your thoughts on, as you've seen things unfold here in the last month? Jan, thanks for having me on your program. I've been doing a lot of interviews. I've been talking to a lot of people. I cannot keep up with what's going on. 
what I'm seeing right now is that the anti-Semites do not even care to hide anymore. They don't mind if they are being identified as such. It's an all-out war against the Jews. The beast is out of the box, mm -hmm. and I don't going to be able to close it back. I can't believe I'm living through this, because this is definitely not the tribulation where you and right. I are we're pre mill pre-trib. We think the rapture will happen first, but there's no guarantee that nothing bad's going to happen before. And here we are. I don't know if you've heard, Jan, but I'm from France. I have a lot of connection there still. My whole family's there. There was a group of people, they haven't been cut that I know of yet, a group of people that were going through Jewish neighborhoods using stencil and spray paint to put stars of David on buildings and on private homes to identify where the Jews live. Jan, this is 1938 crystal art all over again. I totally agree. Trevor Rubenstein, your thoughts here in the last month that you've been observing? It breaks my heart, Jan, but honestly, I'm not surprised. And you are one of the very few voices that's been around propagating and letting people know that this is coming, that anti-Semitism is coming, that it's developing, that it's getting worse. So I really appreciate that you're a voice for that, Jan, because we've been warning people for a long time. The reality is, as the world becomes more and more anti-Jesus, it's going to become more and more anti-Jewish. And it's exactly what we see occurring. And again, it shouldn't be surprising. We've seen it throughout history. There has not been a break in history in which any length of time, really, where this hasn't happened. The unfortunate thing, really, I think the unique thing in our circumstances, America has been a bastion of peace for the Jewish people for the most part. And so to see it here and develop here is really shocking. I actually have seen some things that are very encouraging in spite of the darkness of the last four or five weeks. Here's an email I got. This happens to be from a local church, not that far from where we're recording, Victory Baptist Church. They say this, Pastor Aaron Broughton says, I had you on my mind today and wanted to express our solidarity with Israel and our Jewish friends. He says, Victory Baptist Church of Maple Grove proudly displays an Israeli flag in the auditorium, and we have the message, Pray for the Peace of Jerusalem, displayed on our church sign. The other day, a Jewish lady from the area called us to say, thanks for loving us and standing with Israel. She took a picture of the sign and posted it on social media, group of Jewish mothers in the metro area. The conflict will not end soon, but we are praying for God to work in the midst of this crisis for his glory. May the Lord bless and protect your ministry. I'm Yisrael Chai, Pastor Aaron Broughton. So those things encourage me greatly. I'm seeing Amir Sarfati posts images literally from around the world of churches standing with Israel. And Trevor, you have told me that in Israel there is a response to the gospel. Tell me about it. So our organization, Right Chosen People, Jim, we have 30 or so mm -hmm. employees full-time. And the ones that weren't called to serve in the military, anyone 40 years or younger, have continued to serve. And we have individuals that were able to do distribution of needs in places of Israel to where they really have great needs now. I mean, a lot of people are displaced from their homes. Over 300,000 is my understanding mm -hmm. of Israelis. So we would go to different locations for distribution. One of the locations we went to actually was a police department. One of the police officers there is an Orthodox Jewish man, and he knows that we're believers in Jesus. And he told one of our people, he said, I have to apologize. He said, I've always looked disparagingly upon Messianic Jews, Jewish believers in Jesus. And he said, and we're united in this. And he said, and because of my wrong heart, I want to know more about this person, Jesus. Also, mm -hmm. there's a young lady that in the midst of all this, she started reading Zechariah chapter 12, which is really talking about the nations coming against Israel. And then when she got to verse 10, that talks about God whom we pierced returning to Israel in the midst of their tragedy. She came to believe in Jesus and recently has been baptized. So, I mean, as the Lord works redemptively in the midst of great tragedy, and that has to be our prayer, is that he continues to do so. Olivier, you were talking to me off fear here about what some folks can do. Why don't you talk to us about that? It's over two decades now that I've been monitoring this, and we're at a place right now, Jan, that we're not going to stop anti-Semitism. It's still the right moral thing to fight it, whichever way we can. But we're not going to stop it. Right now, I think it's a time for Christians today to start thinking really hard about what they can do materially, physically, they can do to help Jewish people. We are at a place where some Christians might find some of their Jewish friends come to them and desperately going like, I don't know where to go, but I know that you're a Christian. You say you love Israel. Can you help? We're at a place where... Christians today can have a chance to 
redeem their parents and grandparents who 80 years ago turned their back on the mm. Jewish people for the most part and became bystanders facilitating the work of the perpetrators. So I think we are now at a place where Christians can basically say, hey, sure, can I rescue you? Can I shelter you? Can I feed you? Whatever it's going to take. Very much like what's going to happen in the tribulation with the sheep and the goat, Gentiles helping Jewish people just because they understand their place in God's program. I think we're there right now. That principle can be applied now, and it would make a difference, and it would also open a lot of doors for us to share the gospel, kind of like what Trevor just shared with us about what's happening in Israel. By the way, folks, check out Olivier Melnick's book, The Normalization of Anti-Semitism, When the Oldest Hatred Becomes the New Normal. You can find that on Amazon. This book has not been marginalized, as you heard first part of the program with Dr. Mark Hitchcock. And you can learn more at his website, newantisemitism.com, newantisemitism.com. Trevor? Just really quickly to add on to what Olivier was saying. During the time of the Holocaust, there were many wonderful Christians that risked their lives to save Jewish people. And we actually saw Jewish people coming to faith through this process The word within John chapter 15, verse 13, it says, greater love has no one than Mm. this, than to lay one's life down for his friends. And what a great testimony to be able to risk your life for the sake of others, which is exactly what Jesus did for us. I want to play a short clip of Dr. Dave Reagan. I maintain hardly anybody understands this better than Dave Reagan. He's been speaking out on behalf of the Jewish people for over 40 years. Far more important than these secular reasons or the spiritual reasons all Christians should be praying for Israel. For one thing, the Jewish people are the chosen people of God, chosen to be a witness of Him throughout the world. Christians often protest this truth by saying, but they are in rebellion against God, for they have rejected His Son as their Messiah. That is true. But even in their rebellion, they continue to be God's chosen people, and as such, they are an incredible witness of God's amazing grace. You see, Any God created by the mind of man would have washed His hands of the Jewish people a long time ago because even their own prophets marveled over their stubbornness in relating to God and His purposes for them. But the true God of this universe is a God of grace who has never abandoned His beloved people. In fact, His faithful and never-ending love for them is demonstrated in the great miracle of their regathering to their homeland in the midst of their continuing rebellion. Further, God has regathered them for a purpose. Bible prophecy reveals that He is going to bring the whole world against them, which He is now doing. And the result of this intense persecution is that they will ultimately come to the end of themselves and turn to Him and receive His Son Yeshua as their Messiah, resulting in the salvation of a great remnant. In the meantime, we are commanded in Psalm 122 to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And since Bible prophecy reveals that Jerusalem will not experience peace until the Prince of Peace, Yeshua, returns, then a prayer for the peace of Jerusalem is really a prayer for the second coming of the Messiah. Keep in mind that Jesus Himself said that He would not return until the Jewish people are willing to proclaim, Baruch haba Bashim Adonai, Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. So, Share the good news of Yeshua with your Jewish friends and pray earnestly for their salvation. And in the meantime, every morning when you awake, shout from the depth of your heart, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Yeshua. Olivier, I think the thing that I probably am the most troubled by, and that would be I'm going back to some church issues because we talk about them pretty endlessly here. I read that one email, which is indicative, quite frankly, of tens of thousands of people who have awakened to find Lo and behold, they are in a church that is a supersessionist church, that the church believes that they are the new Israel. Talk to my audience about that for a moment or two. I do think we need to try to set the record straight here for the next few minutes. Supersessionism is another word for replacement theology. Your audience might know it under that definition. And basically, it's the belief that, like Dr. Reagan was mentioning in his little clip here, that God has forsaken the Jewish people, the church has replaced Israel, and it really is not validated by anything in Scripture. It is clear that the covenants that God made with Israel are eternal and unconditional, and Israel is still very much a part of His plan, as a matter of fact. Like Reagan just said, it is the Jewish people who are going to call upon Yeshua to return at the end of the tribulation. So, Replacement theology is definitely, I look at it as being anti-Semitic. 
I think it's a creation of Satan infiltrating the church and putting that in the mind of Christians, many of them, who don't think that far. They just think it's kind of an innocent way, a different way to looking at the Bible. But I think right now, with what's happening against the Jews and, and the lack of support that we get from many churches are very supportive. I understand that. But we also get a lot of churches in evangelical circles that are not supportive, that are not saying anything about Israel at all. Mm -hmm. I saw this thing online the other day. If your church has not mentioned Israel in the last few weeks, it's time to look for another church. I believe that. I do too. And it's not just about Israel. The church has to be teaching the whole counsel of God. That's but right. When you teach the whole counsel of God, you absolutely cannot avoid speaking about Israel and the Jewish people almost in every chapter. So if you teach the whole Bible and you completely ignore Israel and the Jewish people, you're not really teaching the Bible. Trevor, you and I really aren't invited to speak at a church that marginalizes Israel. If we were, we'd figure it out real quickly. And it presents some immediate problems because we want to tell the truth to the people and their Bible is not being taught very accurately. What do people do when they find themselves, as this gal wrote, when she realized that her pastor was praying for Palestine and that's it? Yeah. One of the things that she might want to do is introduce her pastor to your radio program, Jan, where they mm -hmm. can hear about dispensational eschatology, which includes Israel very clearly and is very biblical. So that could be one of the things. But the reality is, unfortunately, as you said, if somebody's asking you to come and to speak, removing the promises to Israel, it's like asking you to fight with a hand tied behind mm -hmm. your back. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is in the scripture. It's limiting what is there and trying to get it to propagate a certain narrative. Unfortunately, this has been something that a lot of churches have had. More recently, of course, it's another growing movement. But for many years, a lot of the churches were teaching that God's promises to Israel look like they're going to be literally fulfilled after the formation of the nation of Israel. And so it looked positive for a while, but sometimes those trends continue positively and sometimes, unfortunately, they don't. Well, the reformers didn't help in this situation. The reformers have complicated the replacement theology scenario. Just being honest here, folks. And that's an unfortunate reality because when they culminated their religious system, it was at a time to where Israel was not a nation. Yes, but, exactly. But with an understanding of that Jesus could return imminently at any point in time, they had to assume that, well, maybe the Israel verses were spiritual and not physical. But we don't have that excuse any longer. Israel's a nation. We can believe the very literal text and exactly what it states regarding Jesus coming back to a Jewish Jerusalem. I want to play one more clip. This again is Dr. Dave Reagan, and here he's talking about Christian Palestinianism. And folks, I want you to get familiar with this term. It's a part of the replacement theology scenario. In recent years, a new form of this anti-Zionism has raised its ugly head in the form of the Christian Palestinian movement that our colleague Paul Wilkinson has spoke to us about several times. James Showers, director of the Friends of Israel, has defined the movement in the following words. Christian Palestinianism claims modern Israel has no biblical connection with or justification for owning the promised land. Therefore, it concludes Israel has become an apartheid state occupying territory belonging to the Palestinian Arabs. The movement's most prominent leaders over the past few years are the following. Stephen Sizer, Anglican vicar of Christ Church in Surrey, England. As far as I'm concerned, he might as well have his arm around Hitler. Gary Burge, ordained Presbyterian minister and professor of New Testament at Wheaton College. Donald Wagner, ordained Presbyterian minister and director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at North Park University in Chicago, Illinois. John Stott, the late theologian and rector emeritus of All Souls Church in London. Hank Hanegraaff, president of the Christian Research Institution and host of the Bible Answer Man radio program. Tony Campalo, Baptist minister, author, and professor emeritus of sociology at Eastern University in Pennsylvania. Lynn Hybels, wife of Willow Creek Church senior pastor and founder Bill Hybels. Name Atik, founder of Sabil, the Palestinian Ecumenical Liberation Theology Center in Jerusalem, and Mitri Rahib, the pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church in Bethlehem. Stephen Sizer is the recognized champion of the Palestinian movement. He has denounced Israel as an apartheid state, which he claims is guilty of ethnic cleansing. Further, he has dem demonized you and me, Christians who support Israel, as Heretical Armageddonites, whose interpretation of the Bible provides a theological endorsement for a racial segregation, apartheid, and war. 
One of the movement's greatest propaganda tools is the Kairos Palestinian document adopted in 2009. It declares that the Israel Israeli occupation of Palestine, Palestinian land is a sin against God and humanity. And it further asserts that any theology seemingly based on the Bible that legitimizes the occupation is far from Christian teaching because it calls for violence and holy war in the name of God Almighty. That's a mouthful when you consider the fact that it is the Muslims, not Christians. Who are calling for holy war in the name of God. The proponents of the movement hold Christian Zionists in open contempt. John Stott denounced Christian Zionism as biblically anathema to the Christian faith. Hank Hanegraaff wrote, Christian Zionist beliefs and behaviors are the antithesis of biblical Christianity. One British journalist, Alan Hart, who supports the Christian Palestinian movement, went so far as to make this statement on his website. It's time to give Israel's hardcore Zionists their real name. They are the new Nazis. If Europeans and Americans don't stop the new Nazis, it's likely their end game will be the extermination of millions of Palestinians. And so you have it. An overview of the sad and sordid history of Christian anti-Semitism rooted in replacement theology and continuing this day under the guise of of anti-Zionist. Trevor, your thoughts on particularly the clip we just heard. What Christian Palestinianism is really teaching is extermination of the Jewish people in Israel. How can we say that's Christian? It's absolutely ridiculous. And of course, the Lord uses both historically and prophetically anti-Semitism to judge the nations. We see this starting with Egypt, right, where the Lord brought great judgment upon Egypt because of their treatment of the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. After Israel comes into the promised land, we see that he does this with Assyria, with their abuse of the people of Mm -hmm. Israel. And we see that he does this with Babylon, with their abuse. Even in the book of Esther, for example, it was a group of people coming against the Jewish people living in diaspora and God judged them. And even prophetically, we look at the Ezekiel War. God is using the nation's anti-Semitism to bring judgment upon them. In Zechariah, we see the same thing. You know what my greatest concern is, Jan, when I see this heart? is I wonder, are these people that are professing Jesus bringing themselves into some form of condemnation by coming against God's very promises? You could contact my guests at Chosen People Ministries, chosenpeople.com. You can access Olivier Melnick's website, newantisemitism.com. Find his book, The Normalization of Antisemitism, When the Oldest Hatred Becomes the New Normal, on Amazon. And I had both gentlemen on about six to eight weeks ago. Obviously, this is new programming in light of the crisis and even catastrophe that has broken in God's land starting on October the 7th. What a fateful and horrific day. Olivier, what were your thoughts when you saw the initial news coverage of the catastrophe of October the 7th? I was supposed to get on a plane the next day to take a group of 46 people to Israel. Mm. On October 8th. So needless to say, it got canceled. But my first thought on Saturday, on the 7th, when I heard about what was happening, my first thought, Jan, because I've been to Israel many times, was, oh, another terrorist attack. This too shall pass. Hmm. We're still going. And then within two hours, I'm going like, oh, no, it's different. And then it just developed into this full-blown attack on Israel, 1,400 plus dead people. And what amazes me is we've seen and heard about the horrors of what Hamas did to the Israelis. But what amazes me is how quickly the world Hmm. turned against Israel, not the whole world again, but a lot of it turned against Israel and in favor, not even poor Palestinians, but in favor of Hamas. Yes. And it's showing you how demonic it is. You took the word out of my mouth, Olivier. Thank you. It is demonic. Yes. And when people listen to the news and watch all this, I think a good principle to remember is this man by the name of Natan Sharonsky, who lives in Israel. He's from the former Soviet Union, and he has developed this three Ds of anti-Semitism. And when you look at something to ask yourself at your church or anywhere, is this anti-Semitism? He says if it's demonization or delegitimization or double standard, if it fits any of those three, then it's anti-Semitism. Trevor, your thoughts? Yeah, when I heard about this, Jan, I was just destroyed. Yeah. The great tragedy of lives just being eliminated for no reason other than for political gain. In the most barbarous manner. Oh, just horrific. And something that can't be done with a human heart. Actually, I think that, if I'm not mistaken, one of the Hamas operatives that was captured said that we behaved like animals. 
even in describing his own action when they realized what they did. It was just clearly, clearly of the enemy. Mm. And the atrocity, Jan, and even the thought of Hamas doing this, because Hamas knows that in doing this, Israel has to respond. And the leaders of Hamas have a full understanding also that if they respond and many Palestinians are killed, that they'll get more financial support and they'll get more support for their movement. So really, the leaders don't care about their own people. They sacrifice them for their own benefit. And that's exactly what we saw happen, Jan. Because I remember thinking, what do they plan on accomplishing? Israel is going to have to retaliate. But the recognition is they don't care. They like that. It brings them more donations. It brings them more support. And their people are just simply fodder. I haven't quite recovered from that October 7th event. Now, many weeks ago, and I think it will stay in the minds of people for the Lord tarries for years. For some reason, the Lord allowed it. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly, Hosea 5.15. According to you, Trevor, they are seeking the Lord earnestly. Yeah, and not always right regarding Jesus. And so this is why we have to be very active in sharing Jesus with people. Because one thing that we know is happening in Israel is a lot of this very secular nation, a lot of the people are becoming more religious. But for them, their understanding of what religious is, is Orthodox Judaism. Mm. So the soldiers are asking for more talit, more representation of rabbinical Judaism. And while I'm happy that they're coming to really move an attempt to seek God, rabbinical Judaism does not offer eternal life. Yeah. Only Jesus does. And so it's very important that we continue to show the people of Israel that the church loves and supports them, that the church loves the Jewish people, because in a time where they see that the rest of the world is coming against them and hating them, that your love and support can be a powerful testimony to the truth of Jesus and God willing will get them to investigate whether or not he's truly the Messiah. Folks, if you've got somebody that you're dealing with, Jewish person who's asking questions, why don't you reach out to either Trevor Rubenstein or Olivier Melnick. Again, go through chosenpeople.com. Is that the best method of contact, Trevor, for you? Absolutely. And for you too, Olivier, chosenpeople.com or newantisemitism.com? Either, anytime. And again, check out his book, The Normalization of Anti-Semitism. You actually have lots of books available, and they are on Amazon. Gentlemen, thank you both, by the way. I want to thank you for coming on air with me. Obviously, you're both very, very busy, and that's good. People are seeking what you have to say, what you have to think, where you think things are going. I want to go out of the program here. I'm going to play a short clip of Sarah Huckabee Sanders to close my program, folks. Next week, I'll hope to have Michelle Bachman on air with me, and I guarantee you, Michelle is going all over trying to wake people up as to the importance of what's happened here. The world changed October 7th. It will never be what it used to be, I promise you. Sarah Huckabee Sanders, I think, sums up a lot of things we've talked about for the whole hour. I'm going to let her close the program. Again, thanks for listening, folks. I hope you'll enjoy what Sarah Huckabee Sanders has to say. This message is for my friends in Israel. It's a story about an 11-year-old girl. Years ago, this girl and her family traveled to Israel. One of the last stops on their trip was Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem commemorates one of the darkest parts of human history, the Holocaust. It sits high up on Mount Herzl, often called the Mount of Remembrance. And it stands for the Jewish people killed in the Holocaust who had no descendants to carry on their name. It's pretty heavy for any kid, much less an 11-year-old girl. And her parents weren't sure if she was ready for it but they wanted her to understand the importance of standing up against evil. So they decided to bring her. The girl's father promised to stay with her throughout the entire time they were in the museum. If he said it became too much, he'd simply take her outside. As they walked through Yad Vashem, the girl watched videos of entire families being marched to their deaths. She saw the hundreds of shoes taken right off of the feet of Jewish children her own age and piled high to be burned. She listened as the names of the 1.5 million Jewish children murdered by the Nazis were read off one by one and was told it takes months to get through the full list. The 11-year-old girl didn't speak at all as she walked through each of the exhibits. She gripped her father's hand tighter and tighter. He worried that they'd made a mistake that it was too much for her to take in and to wrap her head around. But eventually they got to the end of the museum where there was a guest book for visitors to sign. The girl reached up and took a pen out of the father's shirt pocket. 
and he looked over her shoulder. The father watched as his daughter wrote down her name and her address, and then in careful handwriting, the little girl paused and wrote, why didn't somebody do something? Tears welled in the father's eyes, and in that moment, he knew that she got it. Very simply, why didn't somebody do something? He knew that his daughter understood. He knew that she understood that all it takes for evil to win is for good people to stand by and do nothing. I know this story and the impact it had because I was that girl. In the ongoing battle between good and evil, each of us can do something. And I know each of you will. I certainly know the American people will. And we will stand with you. Together, we will stand against evil and we will never apologize for it. With God as our witness, we know how this story ends. The enemy will be defeated and good will prevail. You are the healer, Jesus Redeemer. Contact us through our website, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. Call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. We get our mail when you write to Olive Tree Ministries and Jan Markell, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. That's Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. All gifts are tax deductible. We believe the words of the psalmist that our times are in his hands, even when they are perilous and unspeakably dark. We have new opportunities to talk about the peace only the Prince of Peace offers. We can calm hearts that are fearful. We can neutralize dark headlines. We have been called for such a time as this as we watch all things fall into place.